Science Magazine presents a special issue each year on the scientific breakthrough of the year. In 2007, it's human genetic variation. In 2001, researchers came out with the first drafts of the human genome. They were incomplete. There were a lot of places where they didn't know the sequence. And so they kept working on that. By 2003, we had a reference genome. That's where almost all the bases were in the right place. In April of 2003, there will be three dramatic events all happening at once. It historically turns out to be the 50th anniversary of the publication of Watson and Crick's famous paper describing the double helix. It is the month where we will have completed all of the original goals of the Human Genome Project, including sequencing our own instruction book, The Human Genome. And it is the month where we will unveil a plan, a bold, audacious plan uh, for the future of where genome research can take us next. That plan included several flagship projects. In addition, researchers from around the world continued to work on understanding how the human genome differed from that of other species. A very exciting part of what we've learned from the advances in DNA sequencing over the last four years uh, since the human genome was sequenced is how it compares with that of other organisms. More than three dozen vertebrates have now had their genome sequenced either to draft or complete form, and that allows by computer a lot of comparisons to be made. And of course, one zeroes in rather quickly on parts of the genome that appear to be similar between organisms because those are probably the ones with the most important function. Basically, we're looking at evolution's lab notebook and figuring out which experiments worked. And that tells you a lot about parts of the genome that we didn't otherwise really know were important. So less than a year ago, we were really interested in how our genome compared to our closest cousins, the chimps and the macaque. And by looking at that, we could figure out what it was that made us human. But we have new technologies now, and we're able to sequence or partially sequence the genomes of individual people. And so we're able to look at how am I different from you and to begin to understand what about a genome makes me, me. So DNA variation between people comes in many forms. The simplest form, and one that had a lot of attention and was and is, the single letter differences where the DNA sequence is the same except some people have an A at this location and some people have a T. Those are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, abbreviated SNPs. And there are some few million SNPs between any two copies of the human genome. More recently, in the last few years, there's been attention to a different class of DNA variation that we knew existed but hadn't appreciated was so common and hadn't focused as much attention on. A number of groups around the world discovered that in addition to these SNPs, there are places where people are missing a piece of DNA altogether. It's deleted. Or there's an extra copy of a piece of DNA. Or there's a repetitive element, some letters that are repeated over and over again, and different people have different numbers of repeats. All of those can influence disease as well, and as the catalogs and understanding of DNA variation improve, our power and completeness of the search for disease genes also will improve. So genome-wide association studies show what variants of a gene are associated with a particular disease. So researchers have always had a hard time tracking down the genes underlying disease. For the longest time, what they had to use were, was large families. And what they would do is track who, which relatives had the disease, which ones didn't, and then gradually narrow in on the gene based on who had it and who didn't have it. With genome-wide association studies, you don't need to have relatives. You can look at larger numbers of people across broad populations. And from there, start figuring out what do peoples with the symptoms of whatever disease you have have in common in their genome and what they don't. The approach of looking at DNA variation to find the causes of disease, it actually goes back almost 100 years to 1913, which is when the approach was first described by Sturtevant. And it's a very special approach, the geneticist's approach, because it doesn't start with guesses or assumptions about which 
biological processes are involved, other than saying the disease runs in families, let the DNA tell me what genes are responsible. So that's what we've been doing. So now that these genome-wide studies are being done, we have specific connections between genes and disease, between non-coding parts of the DNA and functions, and that's the clue we need to develop a much better understanding of how our genome leads to disease, which is just a first step to how do we reverse it or prevent it. Uh, we read in the press all the time about the gene that has just been discovered for cancer or diabetes or gallstones, because we've had a proliferation of those discoveries uh, this year. But actually, we're using a shorthand there when we say that. It isn't that that's a gene that only the people who have risk for the disease carry. We all carry the same set of genes. What's really being said is that there's a variation in that gene that is conferring a slightly increased risk or maybe a decreased risk. Most of these are not yes-no discoveries. They're relative risks. They're statistical statements. If you have one of those, maybe your risk goes up by 20 or 30 percent, but you might still not get the condition. But the good news is that after many years, decades in fact, of being frustrated about our ability to find those variations that are responsible for common disease risk, they are turning up all over the place. And they're really transforming our understanding of those diseases. For the last 12 months, the big story has been, finally, the tools have arrived to allow us to discover the genetic variations that predict risk of common diseases, the diseases that fill up our hospitals and our clinics with people who have chronic illnesses for which we have inadequate treatments. I'm talking about diabetes, the common cancers, mental illness, asthma, gallstones, atrial fibrillation, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, all of those conditions where in just the last few months we have discovered very significant genetic contributors uh, to risk. Each one of those gives us a wholly new idea about what this disease is all about, and a whole bunch of follow-on projects can get going immediately to try to figure out how to prevent the disease or to cure it in people who've developed it. So we really have crossed a bridge into new territory in terms of understanding the most common, most complex conditions. And so it's been a long effort by many, many groups around the world to get in a position to do these studies, and we honestly didn't know the answer until the last year. And in fact, if you look at a, at a diagram that reports the rate of discovery of contributors to common human diseases as they exist in the clinic from, let's say, the years 2000 to 2004 or so, the rate of discovery is across a wide variety of diseases, maybe one new discovery per year, maybe two. That was actually faster than in the previous decade when you could go a decade without any new contributors to common diseases being found through this genetic approach. And in the last year, in 2007, there are probably 75 bona fide reproducible discoveries across a wide variety of diseases of novel contributors to, genetic, to common diseases through this genetic approach. Our technology is advancing very quickly. Already it's possible on the basis of a couple of companies that are marketing directly to consumers uh, for people to have their DNA tested in hundreds of thousands of places if they're willing to cough up a thousand dollars or so to get that done. The question is exactly how would you use that information? So the more we solve these mysteries, the more we learn about what our DNA actually contains, the more issues that will arise. There's questions about privacy, and there's also questions about discrimination based on our DNA. And of course, since people have a right to know their DNA information, that's a fine thing. But the question of how often this will improve their health and how often this will cause unnecessary anxiety and whether or not we're really doing more harm than good, that will be something for society to watch quite a bit. Because there's not just the potential for improved lifestyle and prevention, which is a wonderful thing. There's, of course, the risk of unnecessary anxiety and concern. There's actually the risk that people will begin to think about using this in selecting mates or in reproductive choices, which uh, might be something that people have different opinions on, how desirable that is. We need to have a lot of discussion in society about what's the right use of this information, what's the right way to do it in the medical context, what's the rights of individuals to uh, get that information and to profit from that information. And I think that if we have that discussion, uh, we'll probably, I believe in the wisdom of people, I'm sure we'll come to good answers. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.